Good afternoon all. Uh, my name is Dwayne Falkmer. I'm a, a board member at the Dutch chapter uh, of Isaka. Yeah, welcome to this uh, yeah, Nuria Isaka uh, square table or webinar. Uh, for this webinar, we've reached out to the other chapters of uh, the Benelux chapter uh, of Isaka and the chapter of, uh, of the Benelux, I meant the uh, Luxembourg chapter and the Belgium chapter. So basically, this is also an uh, Isaka Benelux event. Uh, so from the other two chapters, thank you for uh, helping out for organizing this event. Uh, for this week, we have an event on uh, the GDP, G GDPR uh, and the concepts of controlling and processing in regards of uh, uh, the new EDP uh, uh, B guidelines in relationship to the impact on uh, contracting towards IT suppliers. Um, yeah, the, for most of you know the housekeeping rules, but for the, the participants from, from the uh, other chapters in Belgium and in, uh, in Luxembourg, uh, we've, uh, uh, yeah, because we're using Teams shirts and housekeeping rules, basically, um, yeah, unmute your microphone, uh, stop sharing your video because it impacts the, the stream. Uh, if you record to the event, always uh, record your first and uh, last name. Uh, this is needed in order to find out for us uh, if you are uh, allowed to have the CPO PPO afterwards. Uh, the, this event will be recorded. Uh, we will share that uh, by mail uh, and we will upload it to a YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, yeah, just feel free to chat, ask them to the um, uh, raise your hand uh, feature within Teams, well-known feature, uh, or through the chat box. Uh, and the moderator, Fokuyan, Fokuyan yep. will be, Fokuyan from the toll, he will be uh, monitoring the chat and uh, will be asking you to uh, yeah, unmute your microphone if you want to ask a question directly to one of the speakers. Uh, yeah, Fokuyan, if you are willing to introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Dwayne. I will do that. Thank My name, as Dwayne said, is Fokker Jan van der Tol. I'm the chair of the GDPR Privacy Committee of Isaka Netherlands Chapter. And we are very happy to have this uh, first uh, square table in a Benelux context. We already talked a long time about doing that. And uh, we are very happy that we have also speakers from a real Benelux structure, the law firm Nauta Dutil, with speakers, Vincent Wellens from Luxembourg, Peter Craddock from the Brussels office, and Terence Dom from the Amsterdam office. The subject tonight is are the guidelines which have been uh, released by the European Data Protection Board about the concepts of control and processor. These are the final versions. And uh, as most of you know, or probably know, it's a very important topic about determining uh, how uh, the GDPR has to be applied and, and how you have to deal with all the issues because most rights and obligations are related to either a controller to and a processor. So, as I said, we are very happy to have those speakers from Nauta Dutil. Nauta Dutil is also a real Benelux law firm, so those two uh, those those two facts fit very well together with this first Benelux uh, webinar. Many many years ago, uh, we were one chapter in the Benelux of Isaka, but uh, with uh, the, the growing uh, interest uh, and more and more members, every country are organized uh, its own chapter. But as we all know, since we have the GDPR, a European regulation, it is a, an excellent topic to start again, to do something together. And we are very happy that we have these speakers also on this first occasion uh, of a Benelux uh, event. And I would not longer like to keep you to hold you up. And I would like to give the floor to Vince and Peter and Terence. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fokke, also for uh, the invitation. Uh, we're quite happy that we uh, fit so well together with uh, with, uh, with the Benelux aspect. So um, um, myself, I'm seated in, uh, in in Luxembourg, also enrolled uh, with the Brussels Bar and partner in technology law. Uh, Peter uh, is also partner in uh, the Brussels office, uh, mainly dealing with technology law, data protection, and cybersecurity. And Terence is seated in the in the Amsterdam office, uh, uh, totally focusing on uh, on privacy matters. So um, we also have a, a small slideshow 
that will support our um, our talk of the evening. Yes, it should be. Visible. There it is. Um, there it is. Um, so, as uh, as Foka explained, um, we're going to talk about the roles of data controller and data processor uh, in an IT context. I think you you are all familiar with uh, the basics of of the GDPR and probably mainly focusing on uh, on security measures. Um, what we see uh, in Large compliance projects is that there is also a very important role on some basic qualifications. Um, maybe there is the next slide. Uh, yep, there it is. And we are of the opinion that, uh, of course, in a compliance project about GDPR, uh, maybe there is not always a, a lawyer needed, but it may be good in the very beginning of a compliance project uh, to in integrate some uh, some legal concepts because they're quite pivotal and structuring for uh, the rest of your uh, compliance project. Of course, we have also the notion of personal data and what is personal data. Uh, that is an important concept, but to, tonight we will uh, we will stick a bit uh, on the concepts of uh, uh, data controller, uh, which is a primary responsible uh, entity uh, for the processing of data, and also about the concept of data processor. Uh, you also have the notion of uh, joint controllers. That is a that is maybe a, 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 a concept that is a bit less known, also uh, very vague on the basis of, of the uh, case law of the Court of Justice. So um, it's very important to have the right qualifications before you start your GDPR compliance project. So uh, in the context, uh, not only in an IT context, but in any context, uh, you, have, uh, you can have uh, more than one controller and they can be single uh, controllers in which event uh, each of these controllers must uh, fully comply uh, with the GDPR. Uh, some of the controllers can also uh, be joint controllers. Terence will uh, explain in a bit um, uh, in which situation uh, you have a joint controllership. Uh, in that scenario, uh, each of the controllers must also assure full GDPR compliance. But what is interesting, you can uh, you can distribute the tasks of the compliance uh, between the joint controllers. Uh, you also have to conclude a joint controllership agreement, and the data subjects, uh, so the physical persons whose data are processed, must also be informed about the key elements of that joint controllership and they can exercise their rights against each and any of uh, those controllers. Uh, in an IT context, when you uh, conclude IT contracts, we will come uh, back to that in a bit as well, you need to conclude a data processing agreement and this data processing agreement also needs to identify uh, 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 if you have a joint controllership, the, uh, the several joint controllers. Then you have the concept of data processor. Very often the IT service provider, we will see that on the hand of use cases, uh, will very often be um, a, a, a data processor. Uh, and in this respect, that is also important because uh, there are some very few uh, provisions in the GDPR that are specifically targeted at uh, data processors. And there are speci specific provisions that data processors need to comply with. Um, they under GDPR data processors have more obligations than under the previous uh, directive of 95 and their national implementations. For example, uh, it's for the first time that uh, data processors in certain circumstances also need to appoint a DPO. Uh, they also need to, de uh, to keep uh, data processing records, uh, etc. Uh, as we will explain, data processor, from the moment that there is data processor, there is data controller, and the two need to conclude a data processing agreement, which, uh, which will um, have to include some uh, compulsory clauses like audit clauses, uh, the conditions under which uh, the service provider can further subcontract to other uh, 
entities, which are then sub data processors, as the case may be. And there are also several uh, uh, assistance requirements. So actually the processor has to help uh, the single, uh, the controllers in, uh, in their uh, GDPR compliance effort. Uh, we will also see that uh, there are standard clauses now out for that data processing agreement. Uh, it's very useful uh, to, to have recourse to them, but uh, what we also see in practice is that uh, the, some aspects uh, would also need uh, some further elaboration between the parties. For example, uh, in terms of audit and assistance requirements, uh, these requirements also have a cost for the data processor. And if you do not provide anything in the data processing agreement or in the, the principal service agreement about that, uh, as a service provider, you can be confronted uh, with such requirements and that the data controller will ask them for free. Uh, so that is always an aspect that we uh, flag to the, to the parties. Of course, if we are on the side of the data controller, we say, yeah, don't say anything because um, then you can have the assistance for free. And if we are on the side of the service provider, of course, we say, yeah, uh, look out because this assistance can uh, can cost and maybe should address uh, some fee arrangements as well. So now I leave the floor to uh, to Terence, who will uh, clarify a bit, uh, yeah, the concepts of uh, of uh, what is actually a data controller and what is a data processor. Thank you, Vincent. So indeed, as uh, Vincent explained, uh, there are uh, different roles that you can have under uh, the GDPR. Um, the two main categories uh, are controller and processor, but then we have two different flavors uh, of controllers. Um, uh, firstly, the uh, joint controllers or uh, well, yeah, joint controllers and uh, on the other side, the single controllers or the independent controllers. And so how you qualify under the GDPR really um, um, uh, depends on um, uh, who determines the purposes and the means uh, of the processing activity. So the uh, controller, um, in a nutshell, the controller is the party that uh, determines the pr purposes and the means and the uh, processor just merely process purpose uh, just merely processes the personal data without having any authority as to the determination of the purposes and the means but these are of course uh, quite broad uh, concepts uh, so let's uh, dive into them a little bit uh, deeper according to the uh, to the edpb the uh, controller um, determines the purposes and the means but the means um, uh, primarily uh, relates to the essential means of the processing. So uh, what is meant with the essential means that are, uh, those are the, the means that are closely linked to the purposes and the scope of the processing, such as the type of the personal data which are processed, which data shall be processed, the duration of the, uh, of the processing, the categories of the recipients who has access to the uh, data and uh, the categories of data subjects. So, uh, whose personal data are uh, are actually processed. Um, together with the purposes of the uh, processing, the essential means, as the uh, EDPP, EDPB refers to them, are closely linked to the question whether the, the processing itself is actually lawful, necessary, and proportionate. And what's interesting is uh, a couple remarks. First of all, uh, uh, the these qualifications, it, that actually uh, applies both to controllers and to processors. These are qualifications of the companies um, that process or on whose behalf the uh, uh, personal data are processed. Um, and it's not a qualification for a specific department or a specific individual within uh, a company. And moreover, uh, it, it is really about this influence uh, um, to decide on the purposes and the means uh, and not uh, uh, about whether or not uh, the party actually has uh, access to the personal data because a party can actually um, qualify as the controller, can be the party that is uh, determining the purposes and the means without actually ha itself having access to the uh, personal data. 
And then in this category of controllers, um, as I said, we have two different flavors. Um, and you have the independent, the separate uh, controllers, and you have the joint controllers. And the mere fact that uh, personal data are being exchanged between different um, companies, between different different entities, does not necessarily um, uh, implicate that the parties will uh, qualify as joint controllers, because they can also just both be, uh, be independent controllers. Uh, Terence, we get a question, and uh, that is, can the control and the processor be in the same company? Could you already say something about that? Uh, sure. So, um, well, I think that would depend on uh, how you also uh, how you also interpret or define the term company. If you would see it as the undertaking, it could also mean a group of companies. Then it is possible to actually have um, intra-group uh, controller and processor relationships. But with respect to a single processing activity. Uh, a company would always have either the qualification of controller or the qualification of uh, processor. Uh, if you would uh, define it as as the sing, if you look at the single uh, legal entity, maybe yes. uh, Terence, maybe it's 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 worth mentioning. Uh, I know that there is sometimes confusion about it. If we're talking about the controller, it's not the physical person within the entity who is, uh, you know, who is following up on data protection, you know, it's the, we're really talking about that uh, at the level of the undertaking. And as you said, it's either a processor or um, uh, a controller, but we will see also that uh, a same undertaking can in a chain of, uh, of processing can also have uh, a double quality in different phases of the processing. That's maybe something yeah. that we will um, go into detail too. Okay, thank you very much. Exactly. So um, let's see. I w uh, as I said, if, if you have multiple co companies that are ex exchange and companies is actually not the term used by the GDPR. Under GDPR, the term is establishment, but uh, well, it's essentially a company. Uh, if if multiple companies exchange personal data, then they're not necessarily a joint controller, but uh, they do qualify as joint controller when the purposes and the means are actually uh, uh, determined uh, jointly, so together. Um, and that requires uh, common decisions or converging decisions from those uh, companies which complement each other and are necessary for the processing in such a manner that they have a tangible impact, as the uh, EDPB uh, mentions, on the determination of the uh, purposes and the means of the processing. And uh, as the primary criterion for the uh, qualification as a joint controller, uh, the EDPB mentions that the processing must just not be possible without the party's joint participation um, uh, with respect to the determination of the purposes and the means. So as Vincent also mentioned, if there is uh, a collaboration between multiple companies, uh, then it is uh, possible that personal data are uh, exchanged. But if you, uh, if you look at the actual uh, specific processing activities, then uh, the, the the parties can have uh, can all each have their own uh, purposes for the processing activity. So it's possible that they actually do collaborate, um, even though they each uh, qualify as as single controllers, as independent controllers. But in this specific scenario, where um, the the decision uh, as to the purpose and the means is really made um, uh, together, just jointly. Um, then the parties uh, qualify as joint controllers. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have uh, that party that processes per, uh, personal data without having any authority as to uh, uh, the, the, the purpose and the means. That is the processor, of course. And there is one uh, uh, little asterisk with this uh, remark that they do not have any uh, um, uh, uh, influence or authority over the over the means because the EDPB actually mentions that uh, they do get to decide about some of the non-essential means, or at least that's how the EDPB refers to it, the non-essential means. 
according to the EDPB, that con those concern the more practical aspects of the implementation, uh, such as the choice uh, between uh, the, a particular type of hard or software, uh, but also uh, the determination of uh, specific security measures that are going to be implemented. And that is, of course, interesting because, um, uh, well, there there can be various scenarios whereby uh, the, the specific uh, security measures that are implemented can be actually quite essential. But um, yeah, according to the EDPB, um, this is the uh, distinction that is made. And then what the processor actually does is all governed by uh, by the data processing agreement that is entered into between uh, the processor and the controller on whose behalf uh, the processor uh, processes personal data, or of course the data processing agreement with a sub-processor. And uh, if you look at the uh, obligations of the processor, as Vincent also mentioned, there are certain uh, obligations under GDPR that are uh, specifically directed at, uh, at the processor. Um, but for instance, if there is a personal data breach, uh, uh, a controller is the party that has obligations to notify it to, uh, to a supervisory authority or even to data subject to in individuals. Uh, but the processor, um, has an obligation to notify such a data breach to uh, to the controller. So that also uh, um, underlines that that it is really the data processing agreement that really governs uh, how uh, the processor can actually uh, process the personal data. Uh, Terence, maybe if you allow me, is it correct that it's like in the area of taxation that it's uh, substance over form, so that the actual roles, how they are executed, are determining which, how you qualify it, uh, or even if you would have written differently in the agreement. Is that correct, or is there some nuancing still possible? Yes, that's an excellent remark indeed. Uh, uh, so we see quite often that in contracts, parties uh, stipulate uh, their qualifications, so they just uh, state in a contract parties are, well, separate controllers and therefore make the following arrangements or uh, parties qualify as processor or something like that. But indeed, in the end, it's all about the factual uh, assessment uh, of the party's rules with respect to the determination of the purposes and the means. If, for instance, a processor would start uh, processing personal data it receives from a controller for its own purposes, which um, must be restricted under the data processing agreement, but of course it's possible that it sometimes happens, then for those processing activities, uh, such a party would qualify as a controller rather than processor, because that is a processing activity for which such party would then by itself determine the, uh, uh, the purposes and the means. So indeed, it's the factual assessment that is leading for this. Yeah, so if, if, if you, when you audit a company, an organization, you always have to make sure that you have unread agreements, but also that you have interviews with the people to find out how it's actually going. That's correct. And, and perhaps I think it's, it's useful to, to illustrate basically on the basis of actual cases, because uh, what we see in reality is that irrespective of what you've written in the contract, if something goes wrong, if there's a problem with the service, there's a chance that someone might file a complaint with the data protection authorities. And so, for instance, I'm involved in a couple of cases like that where there has been a complaint against a client and then suddenly the authority looks into the roles of the companies and says, well, provide us with a copy of the data processing agreement or why don't you have a data processing agreement? And then suddenly you have to justify why the company considers itself to be a controller rather than a processor or the other way around. And so it's very important to have this classification done properly from the beginning, because otherwise it's like a house of cards and you, you start taking out one of the crucial fundamental building blocks and the whole thing falls down. So it's really important to have that and it has to be factually correct because otherwise, irrespective of what you write in your contract, someone is going to look at the facts and is going to say, this isn't right. And so if it isn't right, then you haven't been complying with your obligations under the GDPR. Uh, your the your con your your co-contractor, the contracting party, hasn't been complying either. This can endanger your entire um, service delivery. It can have far-reaching consequences. Plus, 
it can lead to fines. But basically, it can have a very wide-ranging impact on your whole supply chain and your product delivery approach. So it's crucial to have a proper classification from the outset. And so identifying these factors is really important. And so some of the examples that we're going to be examining over the next few minutes really look at some examples that the regulators have given, where you'll see some of the factual circumstances that come into play. But there's one typical overarching question that is always useful is, for me as a, as a service provider, if, if I'm using, if I'm giving a service, do I give the service purely because I get paid for it and I don't get any benefit out of it? Or do I get a benefit out of that that isn't purely monetary compensation? Because typically, if I get a benefit out of it, maybe it's because I'm, I'm analyzing data to improve my services. Maybe I'm doing benchmarking. Maybe I'm, doing, I'm analyzing data because I have a legal obligation to do that. And so the, 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 as soon as you go beyond what is purely, I'm giving the service and I'm getting paid for it, and that's it. As soon as your advantage in providing the service goes beyond that, in terms of data processing, then there's a, li a higher chance that, that the entity in question will not purely act as data processor. And so that basically, uh, we've, we've done our own tool, you'll see at the very end, where we try to come up with questions that we ourselves ask when we are doing an assessment. And it's somewhere around you know, 14, 15 questions, practical questions that have to do with the facts. And if you've got your assessment done, then you're much more at ease because if a regulator comes knocking, you've got a justification. I'll, I'll leave. I'll, I'll get, hand the floor back to to Terence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. But indeed, uh, you touched briefly upon the examples, and I believe on the next slide. Yes, we already have one of these examples. So. Yeah. Vincent. Yeah, thank you very much. So um, uh, we um, we permit the cells because the, the focus is on the EDBP guidelines also to uh, uh, to fish out from the EDBP guidelines some um, IT relevant uh, examples. Um, so the first one is the use of a standardized cloud storage service. So Microsoft Azure or, or AWS. Um, you know that these services are highly standardized. Uh, it's a bit uh, take it or leave it also in terms of conditions. Um, then, of course, the question has arisen sometimes uh, these service providers, they, they, they shape their service and, and, and as a data controller, you cannot say anything about it. Um, that the question has arisen, uh, are these service providers not data controllers themselves? So there, the EDPP has uh, has provided a welcome clarification that the answer is no, because as uh, uh, Terence explained, uh, uh, the, the the tool that you use uh, is not necessarily an essential means. It can uh, it can be very essential to have the service running, but in data protection terms, it's a non-essential means because. Uh, it's not Microsoft or AWS who's going to define uh, which data that you are processing, uh, uh, which, who are the persons concerned, etc. Of course, they have a, a very uh, big influence on, on the software and how it's running, on the security measures, etc. But the EVP is of the opinion that it remains a service provider and uh, to make the connection with Peter, of course, uh, 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 whether you are a data process controller or not, you have to ask the question, actually, is the service provider uh, uh, using the data also for its own benefit, for its own needs? And normally that's not the case, with indeed the, the, the good example of Peter, uh, uh, if you want to improve, if the service provider want to improve its services and uses uh, the personal data to that end, that it can also be a data controller itself. Um, there is indeed also another case uh, which I put as an example. Uh, so it can happen in exceptional cases that the cloud service provider does not follow the instructions of the data controller. It's also difficult and eh? the, the GDPR requires that the, the data controller has to provide instructions to the cloud service provider as a data processor. Um, 
Of course, it will be very difficult to put in practice, uh, but there are some cases where the cloud service provider manifestly does not follow the instructions of uh, the data uh, controller anymore. Uh, and that is typically where uh, a cloud service provider on the basis of US jurisdictional rules uh, is compelled by US authorities to uh, come and hand over uh, some data. So if the handover of this data, uh, which does not happen on instruction of the data controller, takes place on the basis of EU law or EU member state law, then the qualification remains the same, then the data processor remains a processor. However, if we're talking about US law, and uh, you have probably heard about it, uh, and this may be also another topic for the ISACA the, in, in the field of uh, international data transfers. So um, the, uh, the jurisdictional rules of US uh, Enforcement authorities go quite far. So, for example, uh, they can compel, they can ask from Microsoft Corp uh, to that Microsoft Corp will ask to Microsoft, uh, the EU Microsoft entity in Ireland to hand over data via what we call a Cloud Act request. Uh, in that respect, Microsoft will hand over the data to the US enforcement authorities and normally. Uh, neither the data controller, neither the, the, the person concerned will know about it because very often these re Cloud Act requests are accompanied by uh, um, a gag order that you cannot disclose the fact that such request is taking place. In that respect, the Microsoft will, uh, will transform its role for that particular processing from a data processor in a, into a data controller. So that is a very particular case. It does not happen very often, but if Microsoft would do so without the data controller knowing, uh, then Microsoft uh, is not uh, just a data processor anymore, but it will uh, change into a, a data controller. So then we have a next use, use case, Terence. Yes, yeah, so the next uh, use case indeed, uh, uh, well, it relates to an employer that hires a hosting service uh, company to store encrypted data on the servers. And then the ADPB explains that the hosting uh, uh, party does not determine uh, um, the purposes and the means, and therefore it should qualify as a uh, processor uh, on behalf of the employer. What's interesting uh, in this respect uh, is actually that um, uh, before there were some authorities that uh, interpreted this role of the hosting um, uh, party as a as a data agnostic or a data agnost, which uh, just would not process any personal data and therefore would also not have uh, any qualification actually under the under the data protection laws. But if you look at this a particular case, I think there are two uh, uh, concepts, especially under, under, under the GDPR and under data protection laws in general, um, uh, that may lead to some confusion. So first of all, it's uh, indeed the concept of processing. So under GDPR, it's quite clear that uh, uh, the, the, the term processing is really broad and it will also include uh, just uh, the mere storage of, of personal data. Um, so if the hosting party actually process, uh, processes personal data, if, 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 if you uh, uh, qualify that activity as such, um, then under GDPR, you would have to have some qualification. So you would have to be either controller or processor. There's not really a scenario under GDPR whereby uh, you're processing personal data, but you don't actually have any uh, qualification in doing so, and therefore you would not have any uh, legal obligations under under GDPR. And then the other thing is uh, that the data that are uh, stored or that are processed by the hosting party are encrypted, and it is a it is a common misperception actually that uh, personal data, if they are uh, if they are encrypted, that they would not 
qualify as personal data. And it is mostly about the uh, confusion between anonymous data and uh, pseudonymous data. So in general, if personal data are encrypted, uh, um, uh, they are considered pseudonymous data. It is, of course, a good security measure implemented. But uh, if there is a, a, a decryption key and it is possible to actually uh, decrypt the data and after decryption, the personal data or the data would uh, it would be possible to identify uh, uh, individuals on the basis of, of that information. Um, then under GDPR, it does uh, uh, qualify as personal data and therefore also should be treated as, sh as such. Uh, um, uh, instead uh, of anonymous data, whereby it, it, it would be just impossible to um, identify any individual on the basis of that information. So mostly um, for in, for personal data or for information to qualify as anonymous, it, it would have to be aggregated data. Uh, so that is just impossible to uh, make any link between any individual and those specific personal data. It is quite important because if the, pers if the information qualifies as personal data, then it also triggers uh, those uh, obligations under GDPR uh, once it is uh, being processed. Uh, and then the question, of course, is also a bit how, what, what exactly is the activity of the of the hosting provider? Because uh, does the uh, does the hosting provider actually have uh, access to the information that is on the uh, on the on the servers, or is it really just a um, uh, a provider of uh, um, a, a room where the uh, client can actually just uh, put its own uh, um, uh, uh, servers or, and, and store the uh, data on them uh, without the hosting provider or the, the service provider, I should maybe say in that context, uh, ever having being able to access that. Um, yeah, well, if, if you can establish on the basis of the circumstances that the, that the provider does not at all process the personal data, then of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the the obligations under GDPR are not triggered. But if it is the servers of the actual uh, party uh, of the actual uh, hosting provider itself, um, then well, it, it it is likely that uh, that would constitute processing, and uh, such hosting provider would qualify as a processor. Anything to add, Vincent? Uh, no, that's uh, no, that's correct. Uh, but indeed, it 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 uh, it raised the question like uh, if you have the different layers in IT, uh, uh, from what moment you don't process data anymore? Uh, uh, because I have seen, for example, uh, uh, agreements with very large multinational IT service providers for the hosting of a mainframe agreement. Uh, for for um, for the hosting of a mainframe. And that the, the IT service provider uh, considered that the uh, the mainframe was something that is deep in, that is lying too deep in the IT layer uh, that there could be question that the IT service provider would be a data processor. But uh, uh, I think we all came to the conclusion that uh, uh, that uh, there was still uh, a processing of personal data because of that. Uh, that that large concept of uh, processing of personal data, which you just uh, explained. The, the the next use case is also, um, I think, uh, it, it are actually two use cases that I took together, um, and which of course are very uh, uh, very common. So uh, you have the example of general IT support where. The IT service provider will, uh, on a more than occasional basis, uh, uh, be likely to have, uh, 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 that it's quite likely that it will have uh, access to personal data. Uh, in that case, uh, the EDPP considers, of course, that the IT service provider is, uh, is a data processor. Uh, but the second example, it's quite interesting because in, in the end, the, the GDPR does not make uh, a distinction whether as a service provider, you have occasionally access uh, to personal data uh, accidentally or not. 
but then the EDP has provided a very welcome uh, a clarification that uh, when a company hires an IT specialist and uh, to, uh, for example, to, uh, to to fix a bug in, in software, and it's of course not intended and not foreseen uh, from the beginning that that IT specialist will have access to personal data, but where it accidentally happens, uh, uh, I would think that there is still a processing of data in that uh, uh, in that situation. But indeed, uh, the access is quite incidental and very occasional. And in that scenario, the EDVP uh, considers that the IT specialist or the IT consultant uh, is not even a data processor. So it's, it, 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 it is not anything. Yeah? So that is a, a very welcome clarification. Uh, could also raise the question, of course, on the... Uh, uh, if you uh, translate uh, this example to a cloud computing context, uh, where indeed the, the the software engineers of Microsoft and AWS, it's also not intended that they uh, um, uh, that they uh, that they have uh, 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 more than accidentally uh, access to uh, to content data. In principle, they should not have. Or they technically have that access, but normally they should not get access to to content data. There, you could also maybe uh, uh, raise a question: Are the uh, uh, is Microsoft when it's proceeding to that kind of processing? Is it for that aspect still a, a data processor? So, I think the the the, the clarification is very welcome uh, for a lot of scenarios, but it also raises questions because. It's not. Uh, it, it does not explicitly fit in the uh, in the qualifications brought forward by the GDPR. But indeed, you can, on the basis of this EDPP uh, standpoint, you can rely on that, and it will, of course, uh, avoid that uh, that some data processing agreements need uh, to be concluded for uh, uh, for that scenario where there is a very unlikely incidental access to personal data. So Peter will uh, present uh, uh, a next use case. Thank you. Uh, before before getting to that use case, I've seen a couple of questions in the chat about security measures that we'll definitely get back to. But the, the latest one I think is is useful to already mention right now, and that's because it's 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 kind of tied to that incidental processing, and it's about test environments, because this is a very frequent question that we do get about. Um, am I am I allowed to to process data in the context of a test environment? Because typically the the IT service provider that would be dealing with a test environment will act as a processor, and so if we're talking about a test environment that is linked to a specific a client, then the classification doesn't change. When carrying out tests on a test environment for a particular customer then basically it's all in the framework of the same agreement. But if we're talking about using data from different customers for one testing environment for a new version of a product or of a service, and where you basically want to use production grade data, but in a test environment to make sure that everything is working, without it being specific to a, to a particular customer, then basically you're changing your role because then you're no longer acting within the framework of that particular relationship with the customer, but you're combining data for different purposes for different customers. And so it's then suddenly it's a new role. And so that leads to the whole question indeed about how far do you have to go in terms of anonymization and so on. And that's why a practical tip that many service providers have started to do because we, we talk to them about this thing is when you know that this is going to be the case, when you know that you are going to be having to combine data or use data from customers for a test environment, make sure that this is explicitly in the agreement to start with, because then you are covering the data processing aspect, uh, the processing as processor, but you are also telling them, we are also going to be processing data as controller for these, these, these purposes. It's going to be a very limited set of circumstances. And if that's the case, we want you, our customer, the controller normally, but in this case, a separate control, we want you to inform people 
of the fact that we're going to be processing their data. Because you, it is possible in a contract to delegate certain control obligations to someone else. And so you could then have this kind of hybrid situation where you are a processor for the provision of the IT service in general, but then for test and testing that you are combining data, that you're taking data from here and there, and then you are acting as a controller, but then you inform all of your customers about what you're doing so that they in turn inform people of the fact that their data is going to be processed. So you have to really think carefully about are we talking about a customer specific testing environment or are you going to use something where you're just using data from different customers and testing it on a more general platform. So something useful where you see the interaction between the concepts. But then building upon the some of the previous examples that have been discussed where there's been a, a temptation to consider some organizations as data agnostic, as basically mere conduits, uh, as not being involved in the processing activity, uh, and cases where it is the case. Well, the telecom operators present a very useful case for, from that perspective, and I will be perfectly honest, there are ongoing discussions right now between certain operators and certain authorities about this. Because when an operator is sending data using in the context of uh, internet services and in the context of uh, mobile telephony and so on. There's also an aspect where they are sending data without ever looking at the content. And one big difference that they have compared to the hosting provider that Terence mentioned is that there's a legal prohibition for them to look at the content. And so it's not purely a question of they don't have access or they might theoretically have access, they're actually prohibited by law from accessing the data outside of very specific circumstances where the law says you have to intercept data for anti-terrorism or, or crime, uh, crime investigation reasons. So there are cases there where there, there's a whole discussion ongoing about whether those scenarios, they act as controller, processor or nothing at all. But then if you look at the, the EDPB example, it's not really talking about that. It's really talking about um, the fact that the one who sends an email is actually the main controller to, to be taken into account. But it doesn't really decide on whether the one the, the mail service provider acts as a processor or nothing at all. And so this is an example that we thought was useful to highlight because it's a very common situation, but it's actually in a way, it's a bad example because it's unfinished business. There are ongoing discussions about precisely these scenarios. So that's why you should see the CDPB guidance as something very useful, uh, a reference point that leads to, that gives a couple of examples that are useful, but some of them are actually being looked into more in depth as we speak. And so it's very important to bear in mind that this is guidance, this is not the law, and if there's something that no longer corresponds to the reality or that the, or where you see that the technical facts or the technical circumstances do not correspond to what you're seeing in this example, then it's possible to see maybe there's a justification for taking another position. But then you do have to justify it. And so that, that brings us back to that initial point that I made a bit earlier about the fact that you need to have this assessment. Am I a controller? Am I a processor? Is my contracting partner a con controller or a processor? And you need to document this. You have to think about it carefully. Because if you're, if you're faced with one of those examples and you say, that's not right, that's not what we have, then you have to be able to explain it to the regulator. What you then have is, I mentioned, we mentioned here on the slide, the fact that there are specific rules as well applicable to telecom operators, like I mentioned about secrecy of communication, and some of them have a big impact on the classification as controller processor or nothing for a specific part of the processing. And just one point here that's very important to bear in mind, and Vincent mentioned it initially. When we're talking about controller processor, we're talking about specific processing activities. And there are situations, like the example I gave of benchmarking or reusing data for product service improvement, where you'll see that suddenly the classification changes. So you have to look at every single processing activity uh, separately. 
So I just see there's a quick question, um, but uh, the telecom operator is not the controller, but is the operator considered as a processor? So is a DPA needed? Actually, for this is precisely why there's this on, ongoing discussion because the most telecom operators consider themselves not to be a processor for the transmission of the content of communications. There are certain cases where they, they'll accept to be considered as a, uh, as a processor, for instance, when it comes to fleet management, mobile fleet management services, that kind of information, or where you just give a list of people who have to get access, or when they're providing IT services and not purely telecom services. But so you see there's a lot of, uh, there, there, you really have to look at the different processing activities. I think we can move on to the next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. So the yeah the the, the, the last use case uh, it's it's a lot of text, but for it's uh, uh, you can ask yourself uh, what are now uh, situations where there is a joint controllership. Um, and there is a, the the example of an airline chain of hotels uh, and a travel agency uh, that that actually uh, built a common uh, IT platform. Uh, uh, to make uh, uh, to make reservations possible, um, of course uh, you can say yeah uh, uh, how I am concerned there as an IT service provider. Uh, well, it is important to know uh, whether the three of them are joint controllers because um, um, uh, the joint controllers because. Uh, you need to conclude the DPA and you need also in the DPA, you, de you need to identify all the controllers that, that jointly uh, can give you instructions as a service provider. So that is actually uh, the most important takeaway. So if you have a constellation where you see that there are more than one stakeholders that you are confronted with, uh, it's also important to take them along in the, in the data processing agreement. Then the next slide, please. Um, that is not really a use case, but actually it is rather uh, a, a short excursus on the uh, uh, on a case that went before the case, the Court of Justice of the European Union, uh, about the role of a website operator and Facebook when uh, embedding a Facebook-like social plugin. Uh, that was considered by the Court of Justice as, um, uh, as a situation where the website operator and Facebook are uh, joint controllers, at least at the level of uh, data collection and data transmission. Um, uh, just a few takeaways uh, from, uh, from that case, because it, it, it has la larger ramifications than, uh, than just that conclusion. Uh, so the Court of Justice clarified if you are joint controllers, um, then each of the joint control controllers must have a lawful processing. Uh, no access to data is required to qualify as a data controller. It seems to be uh, quite uh, awkward that a data controller, uh, even when it does not have actually access to the data, uh, nevertheless, uh, if it determines the purpose of, of the data, can be considered as a data controller that when you have joint controllers, that not all controllers must have the same level of implication. So you can have an, a more important joint controller and a less important one. Uh, the mutual commercial benefit, that's the thing that defines the joint controllership. Um, if I would uh, uh, just pick out, because we are running out a bit of time, uh, uh, one further element is actually something that makes data protection compliance a bit more uh, complicated. The Court of Justice uh, really made a split uh, in phases of a data processing agreement. And in phase one, uh, uh, an undertaking can be joint controller. And in a phase two, it can be single controller or processor. So uh, uh, with the example of the website operator and Facebook, so. Uh, via the Facebook-like social plugin, um, uh, at the devil at the level of data collection and the transmission of data, uh, 
the website operator and Facebook were considered to be joint controllers because they have a mutual commercial benefit to do that. But of course, afterwards, uh, both of them use data for their own purposes. And in that next phase, uh, the, uh, uh, both of them are considered to be single controllers. But that makes it really uh, difficult because it, for things that were seen in the past as one single uh, processing activity, it is possible that there are two phases with different qualifications, which uh, yeah, which makes data context, uh, uh, protection compliance a bit uh, more difficult. So I leave the word to Terence, uh, a few concluding remarks. Yes, thank you, uh, Vincent. So, um, as we all know, uh, under the GDPR, you have uh, different uh, documents uh, that you need to have in place, uh, uh, compliance deliverables, as it is mentioned here, and uh, the qualification of the parties is really important uh, in order to determine which the deliverables uh, will have to be um, uh, in place. So, uh, for instance, the privacy notice, uh, and the information to be provided, that is an obligation of the controller. Uh, but then when the parties are joint controllers, uh, there is an additional information requirement to inform individuals about um, uh, the essence of the uh, arrangement between the different joint controllers. Uh, I also see on this slide, I won't touch, uh, I won't discuss all of them. Uh, for instance, a, a record of processing activities. We are all familiar with the record of processing activities that controllers need to have in place, but there are separate uh, obligations also for the uh, processor uh, to have a separate record of processing activities, which must also include some additional information with respect to uh, uh, the processing and also the controllers on, on whose behalf uh, personal data are processed. Uh, a data protection impact assessment, again, a uh, an obligation of the controller, but uh, the processor can definitely have a role in that. Uh, under the data processing agreements, the processor must also have an obligation to assist in this respect. And it may very well be that in general, uh, a processor has certain information under it uh, that the controller actually requires in order to uh, be able to comply with its own uh, obligations under GDPR. And then uh, I think the last one uh, to mention here is uh, with respect to international data transfers. Of course, under GDPR, personal data transfers from the e, uh, from the European Economic Area to uh, uh, countries outside of the European Economic Area, uh, third countries are restricted. And um, an instrument that is widely used for this purpose are the standard contractual clauses. And now since a couple of months, I believe we have uh, a new set of standard contractual clauses, which now also include uh, 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 clauses for the transfer scenarios whereby personal data are transferred by uh, a processor and not just by a controller. So that um, uh, is a, quite a significant change compared to uh, the situation we had previously. So that's it for this slide. I will. Uh, we, we'll continue uh, with a slide from Peter, I guess. Yes, uh, very briefly. So you, I, I was mentioning the fact that there are there are lots of different factors that you have to take into account. It's really important to carry out your assessment. So just to illustrate, because uh, I think it can give you some inspiration. How do we do it in practice? Well, we built our uh, questionnaire where we look at the different factors. And so together with our clients, we try to see, well, you know, what, what is going on here in this particular circumstance? So we can get an idea, how likely is it that uh, for a particular processing activity, a, uh, an entity should act, you know, should be seen as controller, processor, joint controller, separate controller. And so it's, it's really important to do this assessment together with your advisors uh, because or, or do it on your on your own but basically it's really important to do this and document it because this is what you're going to use if a regulator comes knocking at your door and saying why do you consider yourself to be control or processor because it is happening we are seeing this more and more frequently that regulators are asking the question are daring to bring into question the fact that you have written in a contract that you are a controller processor so have your justification at hand. 
Peter, uh, if I, I, if I know there have been a number of questions as well. Uh, I don't know, Fukuyan, was that? Yeah, why you I had, had one question, Peter. We, we already talked about it. So it's, it's also possible that if you have in a structure of various companies, uh, like in, in an undertaking, that uh, for various categories of data, uh, companies can have a dual role. They can be controller for the one category, for example, HR data, or maybe for travel data, they can be a processor. That's uh, correct. Yeah. So when you make an assessment and, and when you look at uh, where you what you have to monitor, you have to keep that in mind. And also in your systems, you have to be aware when you talk about security measures, you have to be aware where you have how you have to cooperate with the other entities in the various roles. So you, you can get a kind of role play in a larger structure. And another element I would ask that often what we see that you can get updates, system updates. And uh, there was also a question, who is determining the security measures? So if you have all these different roles and you talk about organizing the security and, for example, dealing with system updates that will require a very refined management of all these issues and in the cooperation and also monitor it because it can change in the course of time. Is that now, the correct? advantage the advantage of security is that um, while it is crucial uh, for the service, it's not being considered to be an essential means. What, okay. Why is this important? Uh, because what's being considered to be essential in terms of the decisions on the means is things like how long data is being preserved. If, if I determine how long I'm going to keep your data, then I'm not really acting as a processor. Well, there's a good chance that I'm acting as a controller. Uh, I, I hate to see things in black and white. For me, it's always a bit of gray. And so uh, that if, if I decide on how long it's going to happen, maybe it's because we've discussed that together. But chances are that I'm going to be a controller. And that's why in that particular tool, we work with probabilities. But so if we're talking about security, it's not considered to be essential in the sense that it is crucial to the service but it, it doesn't determine the role. And so that means that if a customer says, we want this particular level of encryption, if the service provider doesn't want to provide that service at that level with that particular encryption algorithm, okay, it's a commercial decision. A, a service provider can choose not to sign a contract with a customer, just like a customer can choose another service provider. So. It's, it's really a commercial decision. It's not a legal decision who determines the, the security measures. If a customer tries to impose something and the service provider doesn't want to do it, then maybe that's going to be the end of that relationship. But it's not going to have a, an impact on the legal classification. So service providers are free to say, we decide security measures because often the IT service, service provider is actually the expert for that and not its customer. So there's a lot of latitude there regarding decisions in terms of security. But many customers, for audit reasons, want to know that when an IT service provider says, no, we don't do, want to do that, we have our own security measures, that the IT service provider is serious, is has thought about it. And so it's really important to provide documentation. Why don't you do something? Well, explain it. And so, so it's not because a customer tries to impose something that it's worthless. Uh, sometimes it's very valuable because it leads to these discussions about what is relevant, what is appropriate. Okay, thank you very much. Any other sheets you would like to discuss? We just have one, well, a couple of more. One was uh, basically a, a, some f a few interesting sources. So you'll have that in the slides if you want to get quick access to these documents that we've been referring to. And then our contact details, uh, should there be any questions. Uh, and because I know there were a couple of other questions, I don't know if, if, there, if there's still time to discuss them, but, uh, but certainly uh, we, we found the, the questions to be very interesting. And so now I'll, I'll see whether there's still any time for um, handling those questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have in the chat, we have a number of questions still. Uh, some, I think, security we already talked about. Um, um, requires processing additional uh, PII. 
well, if it falls within the scope of the primary processing or not, we already talked about with the testing, I think. Uh, Peter, you, you mentioned that. Mm. Uh, we have a question. Uh, security measures implemented to protect the infrastructure of the service provider be regarded as processing under control of the service provider, regardless of the processing on top of the infrastructure the service provider performs as a processor. Uh, I also that's think, Peter, you mentioned something about it, and that is the security not, measures. And not recycling. entirely, but it is it is related to that, uh, because yeah. those security measures are not are actually to, are service independent. They relate to the infrastructure of the service. And and so, as, as, we, as I mentioned, the service provider is basically free to choose which security, which level of security it wishes to provide. But so some of these aspects can lead to a classification as process as controller because some of these security measures involve the processing of personal data. One one example is that if you are using uh, in your security infrastructure, if you're using measures to identify possible threats, to log incidents, to uh, deal with uh, to to deal with um, uh, incident detection and threat reporting and so on. Some of these measures involve the processing of personal data. And so these are things that are completely separate from the service delivery. And so then they are actually acting as controller. But then typically the nature of the personal data is completely different from what is generally being provided in the context of the service. Okay, thank you very much. So then we have about an exception in the Cloud Act, Vincent, maybe you could reflect on that. So there's an exception is asked here that the provider can decline if another law forbids it and a significant financial impact is it involved. Are you aware of that exception? That the microphone. Yeah, sorry. So uh, that there would be an exception in the context of the cloud tech, not to provide. Yeah, that the US provider can decline uh, 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 a request, a request for data, if an other law forbids it. So in this case, I assume EU law and a significant financial impact is involved. So uh, I, I don't know whether about the, the financial impact, but it is true that uh, if um, uh, uh, typically a cloud service provider is confronted with a, a Cloud Act request, um, that and, and there's also an, uh, an engagement that uh, Microsoft and AWS take that they will defend uh, the case and that they will try to uh, to challenge actually uh, that request. And of yeah. course, the, the 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 incompatibility with uh, with the GDPR uh, can uh, can be an argument there. Yeah. Yeah. I just, just to add. Because there's the possibility to challenge doesn't mean that all of these challenges are accepted. And so it's yeah, sure. important to bear in mind that they may, they may challenge, but sometimes it's not going to work. There are, there are lots of restrictions. There are, there are the, the US Cloud Act and, and related, uh, uh, related acts are not unlimited in scope. There are always conditions. But so where, the, where it is a valid request, it is possible to challenge it. But then the chances of it being received, you can't guarantee that a challenge is going to lead to a refusal by the judge itself as well. Yeah, okay, thank you. So then we have a question about which law applies in case of data center, um, with the actual storage is physically sitting on. Is this supposed to be recorded in a contract for storage? So that's a kind of choice of law question. Um, is there a relation between the location of the data and the law which would apply? Normally, it's uh, directed towards the uh, the data controller. It's established in the EU. Uh, then the GDPR will apply, and then uh, there is also a territorial rule that if you have, for example, a US company uh, who is targeting uh, EU consumers or uh, checks the behavior of the consumers. Uh, um, that uh, then the GDPR applies as well. 
Yes, and I think with respect to the location of the processing, I think it's also relevant to mention that if the uh, processing uh, uh, takes place under under the responsibility of of, uh, of EU establishment of EU companies, um, then the GDPR is applicable regardless of the location of the processing. So also if personal data are uh, processed outside of the European Union, uh, but uh, under the responsibility of EU companies, then still you have to comply with the uh, rules under GDPR. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that we have most questions. Um, I have a question still. Companies data for print and mail shops to collect that will be used to print. Now they ask to conclude it with another party. It seems to be used as there's control or lesson between two. What do you think? So there's a question of Victor Duis. Victor Duis, could you maybe detail your question if you can switch on your microphone? Uh, yes, the question is, in fact, uh, if your data controller engages another company to provide you with data to process for a print and mail campaign, uh, is, is the exact case. Uh, is there a need to have a DPA between the company that collects and provides the data and our company that processes the, the mail campaign using those data, but being data processor for the data controller. So, so basically, the, the data controller is another company. It's not the one that collects the data. That's correct. No, exactly. Because then, then basically, both both uh, both organisations, both companies are working in practice for one same controller, and there is no need in the under the GDPR to have a kind of data sharing agreement between two processors. But what there needs to be is obviously a data processing agreement between the one collecting the data and the controller, and the one printing doing the printing uh, campaign and the controller. And then exactly, it is yeah. useful. It is useful to have a contract between the two purely to govern questions like security measures. What what are we putting in place for the transmission of the data? Um, are there are there any particular things in place for that communication channel? But other than that, both companies are covered by the data processing agreement they have with their controller, and and so they're ba both basically acting as a representative of the controller when sending data from one to the other. Yes, exactly. That's what I think too, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Then maybe Frank Blom, uh, are you still there? You have a question about cloud vendor locking, is that correct? Yes, I have another question. I agreed with uh, Peter, his uh, opinion about uh, commercial assault. But uh, what I notice uh, uh, that there is a lot of uh, customers going to the cloud. And um, there are big players in the cloud, so I'm mostly American players. So I'm I'm uh, a little bit afraid about uh, yeah how much choice you have to to uh, with respect to the data protection and uh, the measures you want to, to take in, because the the storage in the in the cloud is not a storage that you can uh, point to, but the, the data is stored. Script. So it's in many places in the world. It's a very uh, a, a common and a very technical problem uh, nowadays. So how do we cope that uh, legally? <laughs> That's my question. So you see mostly in vendor locking, and I, mm -hmm. I think I, I agree with, with Peter, that in the in environment when you walk in data center, it's not a data center anymore. Mostly many data centers. So. Now, in terms of in terms of management of the these expectations, because of the ven because of the fact that they are, I wouldn't talk about vendor lock-in, but I would talk about the fact that they are they are limited players with the relevant size and mm -hmm. capabilities. 
Yes. So that does create a, a kind of competitive advantage for them that leads you more naturally to them. And so maybe indeed there's less flexibility in terms of security measures, but then you have to look at at which level of the infrastructure are we looking mm -hmm. because you could say, I want to use, uh, when, where, because there's a difference between saying we're talking about Microsoft Azure, where you have a lot more control yourself about which level of security you're applying to your mm -hmm. layers under your control. And when you're using, for instance, a uh, web application like uh, Microsoft Teams or anything like that, where you have very little control. Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about the lower levels, you have a lot more control over the lay over a number of layers where you can restrict their own access to data, whereby you're actually improving the overall security package. And so, so it's really a question of first, what is the layer where I am obtaining the services from? Because you can then have an influence on the level of security. If your if the big fear is well, even if I add my level of security, the data still spread across different say, data centers. You are already limiting that risk by saying I'm choosing a specific region, because that is what can be done everywhere in all with all of these providers. You are choosing a region, so you're limiting the number of data centers already in terms of geographic coverage. You can focus on specific areas, even within a large European uh, uh, regional coverage. You can choose a, a, a data centers that are located around, for instance, Dublin and so on. And so then you are also limiting that geographic spread of the data. So <coughs> I think you have to work on different levels. You have to think about how am I going to limit the, the spread of the data? And then how much control can I add by use by integrating my own security requirements, depending on the layer at which the, the service is being provided? Thank you very much, Peter. Um, it's we are already 2017 and I think uh, we have to come to a conclusion of this uh, webinar. I would like to thank the speakers, Vincent, Peter and Terence for their very interesting com contributions and analysis. So your names and contact details, they are on the screen. Everybody yeah, who has more questions, uh, maybe um, uh, they can give you a call or get in touch with you um, if, if, they, if they would like. And uh, I would also like to thank you for yeah opening this first Benelux Square table. We are very pleased with that, and uh, yeah, I hope that uh, we will see you once again on such an interesting topic. I think we can talk talk many hours still about this, but uh, unfortunately, the evening would be uh, too short for that. So we hope that we will maybe get an update of you in some time how things will go, especially when. There are rulings from uh, from Kierberg and Luxembourg from the European Court of Justice about this issue, further guidance, and uh, so that we can further yeah, detail all the analysis we had so far. And uh, well, of course, our public, I would like to also to thank for their attendance and their interesting questions. We have next week, that is on the, the 22nd, we have a speaker from Georgetown University, that is a Professor Anupam Chanda, and he will spoke about, talk about a World Bank report with the title Comparing Costs of Privacy, Enforcement and Compliance in the US and the EU. And as I understand, there's also some about Asia. Very interesting. China, it's a very interesting topic. So we hope to see you then. Many of you again, feel free to sign up there. And uh, I hope, uh, yeah, that we in the in the future also will meet again in person. Um, things are developing in Holland at least, and also in Belgium. So who knows? And but I'm sure that also the webinars will stay, or that we have a kind of hybrid format. Yeah, I wish you all a very nice evening, and thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Fokker.